Okay, you have, you have used throughout your analytical writing, probably in freshman year and definitely this year, quotations for support. Quotations cited as evidence, especially when you see a teacher say, hey, I want detailed support for this, and you think, well, what's more detailed than a specific quote? Um, and that's excellent. So you're using quotations, and sometimes they're used really effectively. Sometimes they're good quotations to support. Sometimes they're not. And up until this point, you probably haven't had a really serious idea of how to use them effectively. So today, let's stop the, uh, the, the mystery. I'm going to give you a very simple three-part method for including quotations in your writing such that you are including them effectively, seamlessly woven into your own uh, words, and linked to your overall claim. Brief note before I start. The quotation integration technique that I'm about to teach you is useful for use for integrating any quotation. It doesn't just have to be literary analysis. So if you're writing for history and you use a quotation for support, you can use this method and should use this method. If you are writing to use quotations for support in anything, this method works. Step one, introduce it. Before you give me the quotation, I want you to set it up. Some people call this the setup. I'm calling it the introduction. Step one, introduce. You give me some information about the quotation before I hear it. Ineffective writing drops quotations in a paragraph with no setup. And a quotation just hits, and the reaction from the reader is confusion. The reader's thinking, wait a minute, who's speaking? Where does this come from? I don't understand. And they're not listening to you anymore. While they're reading, they're confused. You never want a reader to stop listening to your words. That's why your words must flow smoothly. Everything must flow smoothly. Everything must be sensible. The information you need is about the context. Where does the quotation come from? And it could include, notice, importantly, could include the writer or speaker. It could include the work where the quotation appears. Not very often in this class because you're usually dealing with single literary analyses. So you establish what the work is at the beginning. You don't need to reestablish it. But um, some of those students who write debate cases on my debate team and my English 10 students who are writing debate right now often are dealing with many different quotations from many different sources. The introduction usually includes the title and the source as well. Time and place. This could be important. And of course, the fourth bullet, anything else. Quotations differ. Writing differs. You must introduce. That's not different. But what exactly that introduction is will differ from writing to writing, from quotation to quotation. So if I say everything has to evolve or else it perishes, quotation from a separate piece, a setup might be um, when the boys are watching a recruitment video, Leper reacts with astonishment and admiration to the skiing troops. He notices that they are downhill skiing instead of touring. Seeing the sense of this, he observes everything has to evolve or else it perishes. There's my quotation properly introduced. I know exactly where it occurs. I know exactly who's speaking it. So that's step one. Here's an example from Secret Life of Bees. So I'm going to develop an example for you step by step. When Lily first encounters the boat ride home, it leaves an intense impression. Single sentence. Sometimes your setup, your introduction, is half a sentence. Sometimes it's multiple sentences. The leper one that I just made up was two or three sentences. This one is one. I've situated it in time and place. It's Lily first encountering the boat ride home in the novel. And she's probably speaker. Of course, she's narrator, so she's often the one speaking in Secret Life of Bees. All right, step one is accomplished. Step two, include the quotation. You've set it up. Now give it to me. I want that quotation. And I want you to integrate it cleanly into your sentences. Poor writing draws a wall between your words and the quotation. Good writing includes in your sentence the quotation, so there's no period wall between the two. 
at most there's a comma. So when I'm reading student writing, if I'm reading their words, their words, their words, then break, stop with a period, and then quote, and then the author's words, I think, ah, not effective. If I see their words, their words, their words, author's words, author's words, seamlessly integrated, then everything flows smoothly. It almost seems like the writer is thinking in the same terms as the quoted writer. And that's excellent. I'm going to show you an example, show you how to do that. But that's the difference between merely competent writing and very effective writing. Also, of course, don't forget to cite. When Lily first encounters the boat ride home, it leaves an intense impression. She notes that the house was so pink, it remained a scorched shock on the back of my eyelids after I looked away. Notice the shift between my voice and Lily's isn't even marked by a comma, because I have decided that I will start the sentence and she will end it. That's effective integration. While I'm speaking this, and if you're looking at your quotation support, look at my comments. If I say, introduce this quotation, or I say, he writes, or I say, she writes, you should start to understand some of those comments. If I say, wow, effective integration, or that flows really well, then you might be doing exactly what I'm calling for here. Some of you do, intuitively. It makes sense to you. Some of you don't. But take a look at my comments. And you should now start to understand my comments. So that's step two. Integrate your words into theirs cleanly. And of course, I have the citation. We've already talked about citation method previously in this class. Step three, link it, explain it, make it useful, use it. You presented the quotation. So all you've done is said, hey, here I'm going to give you a quotation. Here it is. Now what are you going to do with it? You cannot assume that the writer will think in the same way that you will. Some students include quotations expecting that I, as a reader, see the obvious connection between the quotation and the claim of the essay. Not necessarily. You must tell me what the connection is. You link it to the idea of the paragraph or essay. So once you've given me that quotation, follow it with a discussion of its importance. I want to know why I just read that quotation I read. Why did I just read about the image scorching the back of her eyelids? Why do I care about reading that quotation? What does it do for me? Here's what it does for me. The retention of the image in Lily's mind develops Lily's character change. Kid is using the imagery of the new house as an indicator of that change. The imagery of the house stays with Lily here because of its independence and individuality. This image shows the reader that, bur that burgeoning independence in Lily. What's my essay about? What's the claim of my essay? Colin? Lily's character change. Colin's not read a previous paragraph. Colin's not read an introduction. He knows that it's about Lily's character change because the character change idea is connected and linked right here. Image, character change. There's the link. So I'm saying this image indicates a character change. The house is independent and individual. That independence and individuality burns itself into her eyelids, thus carrying the character change into her. So that little image shows the character change. That's what I've explained in this. And now you understand exactly why you read that quotation. It's useful. It helps me support. Notice with the yellow-white distinction that my largest section of the quotation integration is step three. I'm going to spend most of my time talking about its importance and linking it. Review some principles. First of all, as I've said before, try to make it flow smoothly. You can do that by incorporating it into your own language. Second, write the most in step three. When I was taught this, <coughs> the person teaching me this gave me a mathematical formula, actually, that 
Yeah, you can sometimes follow, sometimes not. I said for every sentence of quotation, I should see two sentences of step three analysis. That's a helpful rule of thumb. But basically, I'm saying the most important is step three. Write the most in step three. Don't oversummarize in step one. I don't need more summary than I absolutely need. Remember, the quotation's important. Step one exists purely so you can alleviate confusion. Step three, it's supposed to be a link. And what mistake? Students make this mistake. It must not simply paraphrase the quotation or continue the context discussion. Don't tell me what the quotation said. I just read it. So if I just read about the image burning itself onto her eyelids, step three shouldn't say, the image is so powerful that it leaves a lasting impression in Lily. She sees the house even when she has closed her eyes. You're laughing. I can't tell you how many student papers I've read like that. I know what happened. I just read the quotation. Don't repeat the quotation. Students make that mistake. No, it's time to talk about something new. And Colin picked it up really quickly. He said, oh, you're talking about character change. That's the new idea. Imagery connected to character change. That makes step three useful. Always go forward. Don't just stay with that quotation and discuss it again and again and again. Make a point with it. Let me um, show you another example. I'm about to draw an example from what I was teaching English 10 yesterday and today. And I kind of thought about this as soon as I was noticing what I was doing with you guys, thinking, wow, this is pretty similar. I'm teaching them to write a debate paper. So it's, it's an argumentative paper. And I wrote a model example, like I give you model examples of the IRA. Um, so here's my model example for, uh, it's going to be an argument for a federal smoking ban. The preamble to the Constitution of the United States declares that the document intends to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Step one, step two. Seamlessly integrated. I've even integrated it in the center or in the middle of the in, um, infinitive. Do you see how the first letter or first word of the infinitive is mine? The second word is what? Did Jefferson write the preamble? Uh, Jefferson Morris? Nice, Colin. Thank you. So um, form is Morris's, two is mine. Seamlessly integrated. Now, look at my step three. This is still introductory material, but I'm still making this is three part quotation analysis. One can easily see that the United States keeps a military and police force to provide for the common defense, and that its courts establish justice and secure the blessings of liberty. But what about the general welfare? I'm using that quotation. And this is a little bit slower than that Secret Life of Bees example, but I'm using that quotation to get to a point about public health. It's a little slower because it's an introduction rather than a developing paragraph. So it's a slightly different style. But the basic structure is the same. And when I wrote this, I've used this three-part quotation structure so often I didn't have to think about it. It just flowed out naturally. And many of you, looking at your writing, you'll say, hey, I use that structure right here because it makes sense. <coughs> so many of you are already using this structure. And when I point to it and say, nice integration, excellent job here, that's you using the structure properly. Find one. Find a quotation from your past writing and check your use of it against this method. I'd like you writing this on a separate sheet of paper, please, because I want to see examples. And I'm going to scan some examples, show them on the board, answer your questions. I want to hear about what's working with yours, what's not working with yours. I'd like you to look back at your past writing and see whether you're doing it properly or improperly. So 
take an example. Take one example. If you think, I want to work with a perfect example, great. It's better to work with mistakes, though, because then you fix them. Um, try to fix the mistake or rewrite the perfect example onto a separate sheet of paper and see what you can do with this method. Omar.